What's up guys, Nick True here. I'm actually here with my friend, Diana Merriam. Uh, she paid off $30,000 worth of debt in 11 months. So we're gonna be talking about her story and some of her best tips for crushing debt. So be sure you stay tuned for that. All right, so why don't you give us a little bit of context? So tell us where were you? How did you get into this $30,000 worth of debt? Give us a little bit of overview of kind of where were you at at this point in your life? Absolutely. Well, so I'm living in New York City, super high cost of living, and I'm so embarrassed to tell you, Nick, that my 30 grand of debt was really rooted in just me not paying attention. Oh, really? Okay. Just not paying attention. Okay. So half of it was from student loan debt, okay. which seems reasonable. Like it's actually not that bad right. to have uh, 15 grand of student loan debt. Yeah, not but bad. I got a full scholarship to school. I should have <laughs> got. And you still ended I, up. I with, had a okay. full academic scholarship and I ended up um, taking out loans for living expenses. Okay. But I also worked, I really didn't need to take out loans for living okay. expenses, but no, you know, you But just the money kind of, was available to you. It was available and no one ever told me yeah. that, you know, people say, oh, well, it's lower interest rate. Yeah. It's really not that bad to take out student loans. Um, but if I would have really thought critically about it, I probably wouldn't have taken out those loans. Okay. So that was half of the debt. And then the other half of the debt was just for me living outside my means. Okay. Just living yeah. it up in New York City. I was going out every night. You know, okay. I was in my 20s. Yep. Um, I was just very mindless about spending. And I think the attitude that I had at the time was, oh, I'll figure it out later. Yep. I'll figure yep. it out some other time. Yep. And, you know, I'm young. I'm going to make a higher income right. at some unknown point yeah. in time. It's fine. And then I'll tackle it. Yep. Um, but it's... It's almost like that time doesn't come because yeah. you can continue to push it off and push yeah. it off. What was the catalyst? What was that breaking point that made you go, I got to do something different here? Yeah. So I was nearing the end of my 20s. Okay. So I was probably like 27, 28 okay. at the time. And I became a part of this kind of mastermind group of women in okay. New York City. And so we all had certain goals almost all of us wanted to get out of debt. Okay. And so one of the ladies in the group sent out an article from Mr. Money Mustache. Oh, okay. And so when I read that, I was just blown away. Yeah. For someone to talk about consumerism and money in this yep. way, it really yeah. like lit a fire in me. And alongside of that, I knew that I wanted to take a sabbatical from work to go to Spain and walk the Camino right. de Santiago. Okay. Yeah. And so I knew that I was gonna wanna get out of debt before that time. It was about two years away. Okay. So I thought I wanna get out of debt and I wanna save money yep. so that I can make the most out of that trip. There's so much there. Okay, so one, one thing we talk about on this channel all the time is the importance of getting around people who are trying to do what you're doing with you. So you're in this mastermind group with these other women who are trying mm -hmm. to also pay down their debt. And two, the thing that you said is this idea of a, of a celebrating a small win in a way. One of the things that's tough is when you're when you're trying to decide you want to get out of debt or save for the long term is imagining your life 30 years from now. What I like about what you're saying is you had a goal to getting out of debt, which will affect your life 30 years from now. But the celebration is I'm going to go take a sabbatical, go to Spain, exactly, walk, like, and do this huge trip that is a big, big deal. That's like that's more tangible. I can feel that a year and a half, two years away. Exactly. It's a big motivator. It was almost like until I had a goal of something specific that I wanted to do versus yeah. just saving for a rainy day. Yeah, one day. Yeah. Yeah. Then it, it became more tangible of like, this is, there's a specific reason why I, I want to do this. Yeah. I love that. Okay. So dig in a little more. So you're in New York. It's extremely expensive. Yes. yes. And, and you know, you're doing the nightlife thing. You're trying to go out, have fun. How did you think through like cutting down your expenses to be able to pay this debt off? Sure. So there's a lot of literature about the big three, right? right? Yep. Housing, transportation, and food. The way that I looked at it, I was locked into a lease okay. for a year. And so my housing costs, I was kind of stuck. The other piece of it was uh, transportation. So I was using pre, I had a pre-tax kind of transit okay. card through work. So I was okay. already doing the best I could on transportation. Yeah. So that left focusing on like food, lifestyle, clothing, the way that I was spending my time. Yeah. So what you've done is you've said, well, I'm going to focus on the areas I can control. Right. Which for you was food and then some other discretionary spending. Exactly. Okay, so take me deeper though into when you stopped going out as much, mm -hmm. like do you feel like you lost something? 
No, because again, I was finding these other creative ways to use my okay. time. So I would host dinner parties a lot. Okay. Um, I used to joke that uh, convenience was the ultimate friendship builder because okay. I would like <laughs> make friends with people in my apartment building. Yeah. And that had a multiple benefits because it had the social aspect to it. I would yeah. invite people over for dinner. But then I, we almost created this like sharing community. Okay. So the people in my apartment building, you know, if someone, like I remember my neighbor's vacuum cleaner broke down. Okay. And so we ended up just sharing my cleaner. Okay. I mean, we're in New York City. We all are cramped for space. Yeah. So that the more that we can share the things that we do have, yeah. it just, it created a sense of community, a social yeah. network, and it also helped us get our needs met. That's really cool. A lot of people around me saw me trying to get out of debt and spending lost, less money. Yep. And they would look at it like deprivation, that yeah. I'm not going out as much. Right. But for me, it didn't feel like deprivation because I was replacing it with all these creative endeavors. Constantly like approaching spending money with this degree of curiosity yeah. of, is there a more efficient way to, yeah. to get my needs met? So one of the things I talk about a lot is what's the underlying value yeah. in, you know, kind of behind a purchase? And is there a different way that you can get that same exact value? Exactly. So for you, so for let's take going out, for example, you stopped going out and you started hosting your own dinner parties. Like what is the underlying value for you? Was it like the social thing? And so you're like, well, how can I get that elsewhere? Well, I think it's it's twofold, right? Everyone's yeah. got to eat, yep. right? Yeah, so yeah. you're getting yeah, that need to. met and then you're getting the social need met. Yep. And um, I think all of us kind of, you know, when we're building relationships with people in community, there's yeah. a sense of generosity. It's yeah. amazing to me how, you know, for me, it was a resourceful way to like have dinner with people, but right. people's reaction to me cooking them dinner, yeah. it was like they appreciated it so much more than just okay. like meeting at a bar. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I would I would definitely say that the creative part of figuring out getting needs met, it ended up ticking like more boxes than you okay. would anticipate. So like, for yeah. example, I stopped buying clothing. Okay. So I wasn't buying any clothing and I would host these clothing exchanges or okay. I had friends that would host clothing exchanges. And so I was getting getting my clothing, clothing needs met, right. as well as having the social fun aspect of it because we're drinking like mimosas while right. we're doing it. Yeah. Um, and then you're trying things on and people are telling you, oh, I wore that dress to this thing and okay. it doesn't fit me anymore, but it looks good on you. Okay. And you kind of get that social aspect while, while again, getting your clothing needs met. I've never heard of anybody doing that. And maybe, I don't know, it's just not where I'm from, I don't know but that that's so cool. It doesn't work well for guys, apparently. Probably, I, I see it a little different. It yeah, work a little well, you guys wear your stuff until they're like I was gonna say, tattered. I'm so hard on clothes. <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't know if that would work as well, but I like, I like where your head's at though. Cause your whole point is, look, I'm gonna control what I can control and I'm gonna be as creative as possible right. to find a unique angle on something like that. So 11 months, 30K. Yeah. And it was almost all through like optimizing here, right. tweaking there, right. and little by little, you're throwing more and more at it. Yeah, right. and I think it was like, it was just this 180 from going completely mindless spending, yeah. not thinking about it at all, yep. to like overthinking it, yeah. right? I, I really did have a, it was like a learning curve. Total shift. And I think when it comes to finances, it's almost like when you think about fitness, like physical yeah. fitness, when you first start working out, it's really difficult, yeah. right? And yeah. you're building that habit. Yep. But then once it becomes routine for you, yeah. it, it's no longer, it doesn't feel hard work. It's almost like this effortless habit that you've yeah. built. And yeah. so now my frugality doesn't really feel like work because I have these ingrained habits. So you're doing all this cutting, but when you are buying stuff, like how are you thinking through it? What's the decision making process? What are you doing? to make sure you're not overspending. Sure. So I think the overarching theme here is yeah. just mindfulness. Okay. And so, yes, I would have to spend money, but I almost went through like a mental checklist. The first step is even just to question, is this a need or a want? Yep. Right? Like to be really conscious of, you know, is it a need because I have to eat lunch tomorrow yep. or is it a want because I just want ice cream right now, right? right? It's yeah. like, you know, kind of trying to really distinguish between those things. Yep. So that was the first level of yep. thought. And then the second level would be, um, you know, is there something that I already have yeah. that could suit that need? Okay. So I've got food in the fridge. Do I really need They're to go really out? To like, can it. I yeah. can I try to optimize what I already have in the house and kind of create a new meal? And then if I don't, rather than just immediately buying it, which is what I used to do, right. I would think, can I borrow that thing? Yeah. And then if I decided that those, you know, three levels right. I still needed to move forward, yeah. I would think, okay, can I buy it used? Right. And then after all of that thinking 
if I really still wasn't able to, you know, right. figure it out, then I would go and buy something. It. So it's just a level of consciousness and right. thought that I never applied before. I love that default process that really, that alone would save tons of money. Oh, right, right. Did you have anybody that was getting pushback or any way? And like, if so, how did you deal with that? Um, no, I think I had friends that were pretty supportive. Okay, Definitely opened up a conversation yeah. for sure because, you know, I was learning so much and I was having so much fun and excited about it that I would kind of share it with my friends. That's for super sure. cool. That yeah. makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Well, Diana, I super appreciate you coming on. One thing I want you to talk to uh, our folks about is you're hosting a conference. Yes. It's going to be next spring. It's all about financial independence and helping people learn how to do what you've done and kind of further their own journey. Tell them about kind of how, what, where, where can they find details? Sure. How can they sign up? Yeah. About it. So the conference is called Economy, M E okay. at the end. Yeah. Fun play on words. I love it. I love um, it. And so, really, the, the premise of it is uh, provocative speakers exploring a new American dream. Love it. And what I mean by that is there's this definition of the American dream that I found where it originated as an ideal where every person can pursue his or her, her unique version of happiness. Yep. Right. And so that really stood out to me because now when we think about the American dream, it's kind of really devolved into what society tells you you should want. Yeah. You know, you got to go to college and climb the corporate ladder yep. and get married and yep. have kids and buy the big house and the two cars yep. and all of that. You get one and vacation a year and exactly, do the thing. Yeah. Exactly. So it's almost like we lost the unique yeah. part of, of life design. Yes. Life. What? Yeah. And no, for me, it, it my unique version of happiness ended up like moving to the Midwest from okay. New York City and going and walking across the country yep. when I went to Spain and, yep. you know, adopting a dog and yeah. you know working from home I mean those were things that um, I didn't really have a lot of examples for yeah. I had to really kind of come to it on my own yeah. and so this conference is really about um, showing people that they can test those assumptions cool. of what you know our cultural conditioning is yeah. really through the lens of personal finance because yeah. money opens options yep. it just does. It does and so if you can get that part you know, squared away, yep. get out of your debt, start saving a safety net, you know, then you kind of can take charge of what that unique version of happiness is. Yeah. Now, where is it located? What are the dates? So it is on March 7th, 2020 okay. at the University of Cincinnati. Okay. And I've actually opened up early bird tickets. Perfect. So you can go to economy, M-E, conference.com. Awesome. Early bird tickets are available and you can see um, the speakers that we have. Um, we've booked about five speakers thus far. Yep. Um, we're looking for a few more. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's going to be a one day full of programming awesome. and lots of fun. Thank you so much for coming on. The Thank link you. to Economy is going to be down in the description below. You should totally go check it out. Please remember that we can teach you how to get out of debt. We can teach you about what we've done, what she's done, but we can't make you do it. The choice is yours. We'll see y'all next time. Hey guys, I wanted to let you know how you can win a free ticket to Economy. Diana has given me one free ticket to give away, and I'm really excited to give it to one of you. All you have to do to enter is head to mappedoutmoney.com forward slash economy and fill out the form. Then we'll pick a winner. Be sure to get it in this week as we'll be closing submissions on Sunday night, October 20th. Also, if you would like to purchase a ticket, early bird prizes will be available until the end of October. Thank you so much for watching and good luck on the giveaway.